Dear chess friends, it's round six of the London Chess Classic and that means we are going to have a look at a game of Hans Niemann playing with the black pieces against very strong grandmaster from Ukraine with the name Andrei Volokitin. It's just a very curious game. I will guide you through all the ins and outs and then you will get rewarded with some very spectacular chess. Let's have a look. Volokitin starts with one e4 and Niemann sticks to his um, main repertoire with the Berlin defense. Knight of six, castling kingside, knight takes e4. And we do get to see this very famous Berlin endgame, which Hans also played a few months ago in this online match against Vladimir Karamnik. We all remember that famous uh, story. I covered it here on the channel as well. Just make sure to look at my best watched uh, videos so far. And that was very interesting because Hans totally destroyed Vladimir Kromnik with Vladimir's own opening. And now Hans is playing the very same variation again. H3, Bishop E7, Knight C3, and Black goes for the move Knight H4, offering the exchange of Knights. Knight takes H4, Bishop takes H4, Bishop goes to E3. And here, black played the move h5. This is part of black's strategy, because what you have to understand is that black has the bishop pair. That is nice, but white has a kingside majority. There's an extra pawn on e5, which uh, can become very strong if white is able to mobilize all its pawns. So ideally, you would like to bring up the f pawn, try to launch your pawns, and then uh, black can easily come under, uh, under pressure. Well, in that aforementioned game of uh, Vladimir Kramnik against Hans Niemann, the move rook ad1 was played. But here, knight e2 is the move by Folokitin. It's an interesting move because the knight itself was not doing too much on c3. And now it's being rerouted to d4. From where it better controls also the f5 square. So it will be easier later for white to advance the pawn to, uh, to f5. Well, black played here the move king e8. The king goes back to its... Um, original uh, square. You may wonder if that's really needed, but very often there will come a rook to the d-file with check, and then the king has to go anyway. But here, Volokitin has a different idea in mind, and therefore I actually think that maybe the move king e8 is a bit imprecise. A better move here is bishop e7, to come back with the bishop. One of the ideas here is that if you ever play a move like f4, there is something like g6 and black can try to set up a nice blockade on the light squares. Especially if we get to see the idea in the game, white played very soon the move f3 in the different position, but now the move h4 can be played. Now let's have a look why this is so important, because after Niemann's move king e8, white played the move f3. And that's a very, very interesting idea, because rather than advancing the pawn to f4, white is trying to prepare the move g to g4. And had this bishop not been on h4, but on e7 instead, then you could have played here the move h4 as black, fixing white's uh, kingside majority, and then it will be very hard for white to utilize that extra pawn on that side of the board. Now, bishop e7 is played anyway. Black is threatening to play the move h4, positional threat. But white is first. White played here, pawn to g4. And now the plan is um, to uh, to expand on the king side. Maybe you even going to push your king at some point to support a pawn on g4, maybe to play f4, later f5. And black's prospects are not that, um, not that very nice. So black is taking some uh, counter measures here with a move f5, putting more pressure against that pawn on uh, g4. But here, White captures en passant, very important move. And if you do take back with the bishop, there is bishop to d4, and the more and more pieces are going to be exchanged, the better it is for white, because you can take back with a knight, you can centralize your rook, and white is about still to create a passed pawn later on with a three versus two. So black is not interested in that and decided not to take back with a bishop, but to take back with a pawn. Splitting the pawns on the king side, and here Volokitin played very nice move, knight to f4. Attacking the pawn on h5, black has to take, and now you would expect white to take back with a pawn, capturing towards the center. But here the move f takes g4 was played. I think this is a very interesting idea, because you keep that h pawn 
on the board. So this is already a passed pawn. Of course, it's not dangerous pawn yet, but later on it can become a serious asset for uh, for white. What should black do? Try to complete its development as quickly as he can. And I think a move like king f7 with the idea maybe to get a bishop out and to connect the rooks very soon, that's the way to go for black. But Hans wants to play it very actively and play it here the move f5. He wants to open up the position to activate this bishop. But things are not that simple because black is behind in development. And here, Folokitin played the move rook ae1, announcing very clear its uh, ideas to uh, put pressure against that king on um, on e8 with ideas to uh, probably play something like bishop c5 when the bishop on e7 is pinned. However, it should be said that maybe it's more precise to start with this move, bishop d4, when after rook g8, then you play the move rook a e1. That's a very nice move. Black has no time to take the pawn on uh, g4 because of bishop f6. His bishop is lost. Now, let's compare with what happened in the game after rook a e1. Black moved the king away from the e-file. King f7, bishop d4, attacking the rook. And now, of course, if the, the rook goes to g8, uh, well, we transpose to the very, uh, pos very same position we already looked at uh, before. Let's say you play a move like rook g8. Then knight g2 is a good move. And you can see that black is not fully completed uh, its development here yet. There's pressure against the pawn on f5. With a knight on g2, you're unpinning that pawn on uh, g4. So white is having a huge advantage. But let's see what happened in the game. Instead of rook to g8, rook d8 is played. So black gets the opportunity to attack the bishop. Now, you would expect the bishop to go somewhere. Let's say maybe c3 or e5, or maybe play the move c3 to protect the bishop on d4. But Folokitin goes for gallery play with fantastic idea. Rook takes bishop. With check, so this is an exchange, sacrifice, king takes back on e7 and now it's bishop c5 with check. And black has to be careful because where are you going with the king? If you play king e8 back, it's rook e1 and on the next move the rook will come in to e7 with check. You get a massive attack with the three pieces against the king, uh, the bishop and the rook on a8 are out of play. So it doesn't even feel like you're an exchange down. Another problem is that the king cannot come to f6 because of this move, g5. And then the pawn is really strong and the pawn cannot be taken here because of bishop e7. With a double attack, you're picking up the rook. Of course, if you ignore the bishop, let's say king to g7, then the rook will come to the open file and there are still a lot of attacking ideas. Based on the move rook to e7, you can bring up your, uh, your h pawn as well. You can try to bring this bishop to the diagonal to hit the king looks incredibly dangerous. So therefore, after bishop c5, only move here is king to f7, but now the move g5 is played anyway. This is a beautiful positional exchange sacrifice. As I said, black's pieces are still out of play and white has a simple plan of bringing up the h-pawn very, very soon. If that happens, then, well, you definitely get ideas to promote one of your pawns. So black played here this move, rook g8, to attack the pawn on, um, on g5. That's one idea. But I should say that probably a better idea is here to play b6, to attack the bishop. If the bishop goes away, then the idea is to play bishop a6, another tempo move. So you see that even though queens are off the board, it's still very sharp. If you go rook away to e1, then rook d6 is a good move with the idea to double the rooks and try to initiate the exchange of rooks. That's a good strategy so that white's rook cannot be used in the attack and obviously black gets ideas to activate its own rook. It didn't happen. So the rook stayed passive on g8. h4 was played. So the pawn is protected and black played here to move bishop e6. Look at this beautiful knight on f4. It cannot be kicked out from its uh, beautiful post and white has nice ideas here to play the move king f2 to let the king participate as well. One of the ideas here is to play a move like rook to g1 followed by h5. Why is the rook needed on g1? To protect the pawn on g5 one more time. And Hans already sees the potential problems and decides here to play this move, rook g6. He wants to block white's pawns. So he is about to just give back the 
exchange for free. Well, if you do that, if you do take, then black finally gets this sort of blockade on the light squares because of opposite colored bishops, white cannot really uh, gain control over the light squares, not able to play h5 anytime soon. Black will hold this position. So now the interesting thing is that Folokitin doesn't grab back the material, but plays for the initiative with the move rook to g1. This knight is stronger than the rook and bishop together. White is preparing to play the move h5. And if h5 can be played, then g6 will follow, h6 will come, the pawns are rolling. Black played rook a2, g8, so that in case of h5, black can just take on g5. Now, rook to e1 was played. And there are obviously ideas to play the move h5 to force the rook to leave the sixth rank so that after that you can take the bishop. Now the rook is still defending the bishop, so that's why it's idea. The rook goes to e8, white goes for rook to g1, the rook goes back to g8, and are we going to see a repetition of moves? No. White has time to improve its own position with the move bishop to d4. Bishop went to d5 and now white placed its bishop on e5, just attacking a pawn. And basically he's saying that black's rooks, they are stuck. If one of the rooks move, then h5 can be played. So the rooks need to stay on the g-file to keep an eye on that pawn on g5. So let's say if you protect the pawn on c7, there's h5 and white has a massive attack here. So instead black played another move. Black went for the move b5. It's not really doing anything. White can just collect the pawn on c7. The bishop goes to e4 and now the rook goes to d1. So here we see that the rook is about to infiltrate into black's position. And you cannot really stop that. In the game, black decided to take the pawn on c2. But if you try to stop that uh, infiltration of the white rook, then all of a sudden you can take on g6. And now this is very nice. After black takes back, you have this move, h5. You're attacking the rook and you make use of a tactic that if you do take the pawn, it's bishop d8 with check and you pick up the rook on g5 as the rook on d1 protects the bishop on d8. So king e7, not possible. Let's have a look. Bishop takes c2. Now the rook comes to d7. King e8, rook d8 check. King f7, rook d7, king e8. And here again, white has the option to settle for a repetition here with the move rook d8, but instead the rook goes back to d2. And that's a very, very good move because you're attacking the bishop. If you do, let's say, uh, move the bishop away, which was not played in the game, then you can take again that uh, knight with a knight on uh, g6, rook takes back, and then you bring your king to f4 so that the pawn is defended very soon. h5 will come and white's pawns are going to be decisive very soon. So black instead played here this move, rook back from g6 to g7, counterattacking the bishop on c7. Of course, white can take the bishop on c2, but that's not what you want. This bishop is very good. So the bishop goes back to e5, hitting the, bishop, the, the rook on, um, on g7, the rook goes away. And uh, well, there is this um, option to take the bishop Obviously, but look what happened instead. This move, bishop f6. Fantastic idea, as white is about to come in with the rook on d8. That's why the bishop is on f6 to guard that square one more time. And black is in big trouble here. For instance, if you take the pawn on h4, then white's idea is to give a check. King f7, rook d7, king e8, what else? And now rook e7 with check. You are for a very difficult choice. Well, actually, it's very simple. If you play king f8, it's knight e6 with checkmate. Here you see the success of white's exchange sacrifice being executed on the board. And if you do go to the other side with your king, king d8, then it's rook h7 with a discovered check. You're picking up the rook on uh, h4. So after bishop f6, black... Um, Played instead here this move, rook to f8. But now, still, you can take on c2, but there's no need to take that bishop because much more convincing is this move, rook to d8, with check. And if black goes here for the move king f7, then there's this move, g6, with check. You're attacking both 
the king and the rook. If the king captures the bishop, then you first take the rook on f8 with check. And uh, if the king goes away, then uh, the simplest move here is just to play rook f7, followed by rook takes rook, and uh, white is winning the game. So after this move, rook d8, black resigned, which means that Hans lost for the first time in, I think, 16 games, if I'm uh, not mistaken. That's a very uh, remarkable thing that he had so much success with the Berlin defense in his career already, but now he just got completely crushed in a very uh, nice way, very spectacular exchange sacrifice. And uh, that means that Hans needs to forget about 2700, at least for now. Maybe very soon he will be back there again. Let's see what's going to happen in the next few rounds. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. I appreciate all your support, as I said before, but let me help to grow this channel. Thanks for that and see you soon again.